I couldn't trudge through human action. Um, I did my best, and I just didn't go anywhere with it. So I look forward to picking up Choice uh, so that, uh, you know, maybe it's the Cliff Notes version. Um, can you explain, because, uh, I mean, the, the business cycle is uh, the very in, important aspect of uh, Austrian uh, economics. It's really what it brings to the table. It shows that we don't have to have this boom-bust cycle that has existed um, up to this point. So can you explain that? Sure. So in the Austrian view, and for people who don't know that Austrian term, just that's the label for the school of thought. The people who found that it happened to be from Austria originally and the label stuck. So uh, the, the theory that Mises developed, Friedrich Hayek won the Nobel Prize in 74, largely for his work on this theory, is they said that the, the boom bust cycle that we're all familiar with, it seems to plague market economies periodically. That's not just some natural outgrowth of capitalism you just throw your hands up and say well there's tornadoes and there's the business cycle right nothing you can do about it the mises said that it's because um in the boom period the government and central banks are working together to push down interest rates artificially low and that sort of goose's investment makes people feel wealthier than they really are and it gives this false period of prosperity that may last a few years but that boom is built on quicksand and eventually it comes crashing down so in the austrian view the way to fix the business cycle is not to always rush it during the recession and try to do things to get people back to work and get businesses spending again. No, it's to, during the boom period, stop providing that artificial stimulus that causes people to make unsustainable investments. And that's the only way you're going to have you know sustainable economic growth in the long run. So isn't that exactly what the Keynesians say? Uh, Maynard Keynes, Keynes uh, you, you'll tell me in a second. Um, he is uh, the sort of the, he's got his own school of thought out there and, and people that want to pump up the marketplace with a bunch of free money. They're called Keynesians. Um, isn't, wasn't that what he said too, is essentially you're supposed to pump the, the marketplace when the economy's down, but when it's doing well, you're supposed to back off, guys. And they don't back off. They don't know how. It's like tell, giving a heroin addict uh, a morphine drip and telling him, well, be careful with this. <laughs> right, yeah. So that's a very sophisticated point you're bringing up. Uh, you're right. In theory, you know, the, the textbook economics you study with what's called Keynesian economics, you're right. They have what's called counter-cyclical policy, meaning, yes, when the economy's down, that's when the government should stimulate. And then when it's when it's in a boom period, that's when it should raise taxes and try to you know, sort of uh, put the brake on, put the brakes on. The, so the so the problem is even. So you're right that they don't often adhere to that. They're all they're all for big government spending and deficits during the the recession. But when times are good, they're not usually saying, "Oh, let's be running huge surpluses and pay down some of the debt." That often doesn't happen. But even on its own terms, uh, I think that that's terribly wrong because what happens is when you're in the recession and they have those artificially low interest rates, that then seem to get us out of, seem to jumpstart the economy and get us into the recovery, that's sowing the seeds for the next bust. So just to give you a specific example, when the dot-com bu uh, bubble burst in the you know, late two, late 1990s or 2000s and so forth, then Alan Greenspan was the Fed chair. He cut interest rates way down. People were calling him the maestro. They were saying, wow, oh, look yeah. at the housing market. He's a genius. Was <laughs> yeah, the housing, the housing market didn't uh, go into decline during this bad recession. What a great guy. But of course, that just gave us the housing bubble. It replaced the stock bubble with a housing bubble. And so many but people not that's just That's not Austrians. Greenspan's fault. He left <laughs> office before that happened. <laughs> right. They, these guys often see it coming and then decide they're <laughs> going to spend time with their families and write their memoirs right. and leave it for the next person. You know, I really got to spend more time with my kids. Your kids are 30. <laughs> um now, the boom-bust cycle often is, uh, to some extent, tied with fiat currency. You can't pump the marketplace uh, full of money if the money is actually backed by something. And this is another thing that uh, Austrians, Austrian economics uh, brings to the table, and that is that they propose to have a value-backed currency. Gold is often what's gone to, but Bitcoin could be it or a variety of things, um, you know, whatever it has to be. It's just basically not allowing human beings to uh, to pump in um, uh, a value into the marketplace uh, in the form of fiat currency. Now, we didn't really even – we didn't go off the gold standard until 1913, but there were boom-bust cycles prior to that, Right. Right. So you're yeah, bring up a lot of good points. So, well, yes, I'm gonna, I am going to milk mm -hmm. this, Bob, because I yeah. <laughs> every time I get you for at one of these events, you're like, oh, I got I got 10 minutes for you guys. No, no, <laughs> I got you for the evening and I want to know what's going on here. 
Um, <laughs> hey, the opportunity cost. Time is valuable. <laughs> I know. Um, I know. Well, yeah. everybody wants you to run the, uh, the 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 karaoke at these events. You're very entertaining on stage, and I think it's awesome. But I never get a chance to get these questions that I have answered. Okay, sir. So, yes, that was a, a very well-informed question, and so you're right. It's, I'm sure your guys, you know, your listeners are very well-informed on these matters of, of monetary policy and theory. So everybody understands the benefit to the government of being able to use fiat currency. It, it's funny. I was showing my son some silver uh, rounds I had just bought the other day and was explaining to him that, the you know, the government doesn't wouldn't want to keep using that because it's hard. They can't just create silver coins out of thin air the way they can electronically create money. So clearly the people in power would prefer to have a monetary system with no constraints because then they can just inject money at will. But beyond that, and that's what everybody understands and people you know, understand full well the danger of runaway inflation is that purchasing power disappears. People who are saving up, they have money in a denominator, a certain asset, and it can disappear overnight. Everyone understands that. The connection with the Austrian theory is, as you were saying, it's it's that the business cycle itself is because typically that new money gets pumped into the credit markets. In other words, it's not that they just create hundred dollar bills and drop them out of the helicopter. No, it'd be they great actually, if they give it to us. Yeah, right, and yeah, it, it enters through the credit markets, so it distorts interest rates and causes investments to get all screwed up. So that's the connection. But, but your other point was, but you know, we were on the gold standard. Actually, you know, FDR didn't really fully kick us off until the uh, early thirties there. So the, the Great Depression this started at least when the U.S., according to standard history books, was still conventionally on the gold standard. And so the answer is, and Mises developed his theory of the business cycle, really what, what causes the business cycle is art, an artificial injection of credit that pushes interest rates low. So commercial banks, even on a gold standard, can do that if they engage in what's called fractional reserve banking. And that was what right. was allowed in 1913? Did that begin there? I, I'm not entirely clear on this. Yeah, I mean, th throughout U.S. history, with a nod and a wink, that stuff was allowed, and they would even do things because the banks would get away with it. Because The ultimate check on... So, so for people who don't know, Bob, fractional hold reserve that banking... Thought. Yeah, I was just yep, about okay. to say what fractional reserve banking is, where the banks can lend out money they don't even have, something like nine times the amount in uh, deposits. Robert but, P. Murphy has the answers as to why the economy is down. And, and if you have questions, do, you can it. dial in toll-free. It's Free Talk Live, live Sunday edition of the program. Of course, you can call in about anything you want, but right now calls for Bob Murphy get preference. Uh, he is the author of Choice, a uh, new book that I presume is available. I didn't. I don't think we asked him that question. Uh, it, uh, Bob Murphy is the, uh, the book. I've been actually, peppering with so many questions we haven't had a chance. Yeah, we've been talking about the economy and business cycle and things like that. Uh, let's talk a little bit about the book here. Uh, <laughs> it, is it available right now for people to buy? Oh, yeah, definitely. If you just go to Amazon's the easiest place. If you go to the Independent Institute's website, they have like a long synopsis of it, and you see the chapter-by-chapter -chapter breakdown. But, sh yeah. If you go to Amazon, it's up there. Yeah, I don't understand why they haven't sent it to me. They send me books now and then. Why haven't I gotten choice in the mail? Um, so it's it's probably my oversight. So they would <laughs> they will. Um, and his website, by the way, consulting by RPM, as in Robert P. Murphy. I'm sure there's a link there. Consulting too, right? by RPM.com. Well, what you can do is if you're going to buy the book, uh, you should go to shop.freetalklive.com. Go through our Amazon link there, or of course you can go to saveitpurse.com and then get it at like 20 percent off. Bob, I have heard um, the you know the president uh, controlling the economy is like the bull rider controlling the bull. The suggestion is that the economy, whoops, it goes up and whoops, it goes down, and there's just there's just nothing we can do about it. But what, as I understand, what the Austrians, uh, Austrian uh, economics, basically started by Ludwig von Mises, what they brought to the table was a solution to the business cycle and the problems of the um, the economy. Right. And just, yeah, to, to tie this in really quickly, the great question you asked before the break was, you know, wh why did we have these business cycles even when we were on the gold standard? So you're, it's not merely whether the the money is is backed up by anything, whether it's real, you know, hard money. That sort of, the, the specific thing that causes the business cycle is having credit flood the, the system People being getting getting loans when there's not genuine savings backing it up, and that's the the linchpin that makes that possible is fractional reserve banking. But the connection with fiat money is that it's a lot easier to flood the market with fake money if you know with fake money than it is with with claims to to uh, you know to hard money. And and the way the government fosters that is by doing things like having banking holidays. 
right? That and that's you know, what a fun throw a bank holiday. Who wouldn't be who wouldn't be for that? And that, <laughs> like that means you know, <laughs> means you can't if get there your was money. A, if there was a grocery store holiday, then you would understand. That means you can't get your food. It's a downright so. bank party going on at Greece <laughs> right now. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So um, um, I know that Ludwig von Mises is, is uh, you know important name in Austrian economics. Um, Karl Menger is the sort of the, uh, as I understand, the one that founded it, created the the, the school of thought. We, right. So, yeah, it was in 1871 that Karl Menger wrote the principles of economics. I mean, he wrote it in German, so it had a German title. And uh, and that was the book that Mises, as a young man, read and then said that book made me an economist. So the, the official founder of the Austrian school was Karl Menger and Mises was like considered like, I think, third generation. What could uh, politicians do today to um, just to, to fix the economy? Is, is it easy or is it hard? Well, I mean, it's easy conceptually. It's hard politically because there's so many rich and powerful people that would you know, that benefit from yeah. the current system. Uh, so the, the, really what happens is it's that right in our day, central banks cause this boom-bust cycle – but then the governments come in during the recession period and do all sorts of things that just make it drag on and on and, and make it just be agonizingly long because that's kind of the interplay. So it's more the stuff that politicians tend to do just makes the recession much more painful and drag on. The, ultimately, the way they would they could stop this business cycle is to take away the privileges that the Federal Reserve or the ECB, Bank of Japan, have because they set up a cartel of banks and just let banking – be a business in the free market system, and if you make too many loans and you lend out too many people too much money, and then it goes bust, or your customers show up and want their money and you can't give it to them, you go out of business. Just and like, a value backed currency is integral to that, right? Right. So just giving, yeah. There's all sorts of policies right now that the government has in place that push people into using fiat money. That by no means was something that people spontaneously and voluntarily chose historically people used gold and silver as money and then i think you know with the electronic age they would have gone to things like bitcoin or whatever as, as offshoots as, as well but uh certainly using the euro or the dollar or the yen right now is because governments have also tax tax policies in place legal tender laws things like that if they took away all those special privileges then people would just voluntarily and naturally move to hard money in a banking system that was much more resilient and much higher reserve ratios, which would all by itself, you know, stop inflation and stop the business cycle. Turns out the free market can solve some problems. Um, when you had said that the uh, sometimes polit politicians tend to get involved in um, the economy when it's down, trying to, you know, revitalize the patient, I'm pretty sure you came dangerously close to blaspheming our Lord FDR. <laughs> um, do you, are you saying that Franklin Delano Roosevelt extended the Great Depression with his uh, interventions? Well, well, sure. Let me let me flip it and put it to you this way: What would so, so if you were going to test the hypothesis, did the, the New Deal prolong the depression or make it end shorter than otherwise would have had he done nothing? What sort of things would you look at? You know, I, mean, I don't what, know, what, man. What, yeah, <laughs> what would the evidence have to look like to make you think he prolonged it? Well, one thing is you'd say. Well, I mean, if that was the longest depression in U.S. history, that would be one. Oh, ding, ding, ding. <laughs> right. So uh, and also. But it's a really lot of bad. People, yeah. And, and the other thing, too, the, the one two punch of that is to realize yeah. Herbert Hoover to that point had the most interventionist response to an economic downturn in U.S. history. So it's a complete myth for people to think Herbert Hoover did nothing. And that's why the Great Depression happened on his watch. That wouldn't really make sense because prior presidents also you know, did nothing in quotation marks. So how come when they did nothing, when there was a banking panic, it didn't turn into a 10-year depression? And the answer is because they really did pretty much do nothing, and the thing fixed itself in six months, where it was Hoover who said, oh, we're going to take the bull by the horns and fight this, and then caused unemployment to skyrocket. Then he handed it over to FDR, who just upped the ante on all the stuff Hoover had put in motion. So um, what is the uh, – is, is the choice um, – is this a book – is this a textbook for people in, in um, college or is this uh, something for the average person? Well, it, it's both. Why choose, Mark? You know, so it's <laughs> – it, it, it was – in all seriousness, it is designed – so it's, it doesn't feel like a textbook. It, it's not written like in textbook style. You know, it, it's, a, it's a book you can read in the English language, plain, plain language. But it's for upper, uh, you know, for economics majors who want to know about Austrian economics, capital theory, business cycle theory, monetary theory. 
it is appropriate to be assigned in a class like that. So um, I want to make sure that we uh, also address, I mean, at this point, I think it's fair to say you're not going to, I'm not going to be able to get you to say it, but I think it's fair to say that you're uh, the standard bearer of the, um, of Austrian economics at this point in the world. But there, um, probably the most famous economist is Milton Friedman. Now he was known as a monetarist as opposed to an Austrian. Can you explain to me the difference between these two? Okay. And, and you're right. Just it would be, I cannot allow you to say such an over-the-top compliment without me saying, of course I'm not, I'm not being that arrogant. So I just okay. want to fish say that. But who is then? I, I just, I won't even say, let's move there on. You go. <laughs> <laughs> if you can't provide me with a name, then I, right. I'm going to go with the name I got. All right, so uh, Bob, stand by. We'll let you answer Mark's question okay. here in a moment. Uh, Bob Murphy is on the line with us here. His website, consultingbyrpm.com. Real uh, brilliant economist. He's here with us Come as we bring Bob Murphy back on here. Bob, uh, there was a question that Mark asked you before we went to the break, and I want to uh, I want to get back to that, but let's get back to it after we get these folks on who have some questions for you. So, uh, first up, let's bring Mac on the line in Washington. Mac, you're on with Bob Murphy. Hey, isn't that fantastic? Uh, first economics book I ever read was by Bob Murphy. Which one was that? Um, it was uh, the politically incorrect guide to uh, capitalism. Yeah, and uh, and I've read uh, three other books of his. And Bob, I have a question for you, if you don't mind. Of all those books that I've read of yours, there was just a few pages of one of them that I didn't quite get what you were saying. I think Mark might have started going in that direction right before the break. Um, you were criticizing Milton Friedman's. You, you spent a couple of pages criticizing Milton Friedman's interpretation of the cause of the Great Depression. I read that section twice. Man, I got to tell you, I still didn't get it. I'm just a dumb blue collar guy. So if you could really, uh, if you don't mind, gelling that uh, down and boiling it down and explaining to us what it's all about. Oh, okay, sure thing. And thank you for the kind words. Uh, so the as Mark had alluded to and the callers reinforcing there that yes, a huge name in free market economics is Milton Friedman. Of course, he's more famous, more of a household name among policy wonks than uh, Ludwig von Mises. But uh, Friedman was a member of what's called the Chicago school. And so they had a, a different approach specifically, specifically when it comes to the great depression, the uh, Milton Friedman thought the, the real issue there was that after the stock market crash and in the early 1930s, people were panicked, and so they were running to their banks and trying to get their money out. They didn't want it to be on deposit with the bank. They wanted to have the actual cash in their hands, and because of the fractional reserve system, this was leading all these banks to fail, thousands of bank failures, because the banks, you know, the, the from a, It's a Wonderful Life, you know, that kind of scene was just really happening all over the country. And so the way the, the system works, when, when you think like, oh, yeah, I have $1,000, like if you have 800 in the bank and 200 in your wallet, and you think you're walking around with $1,000, well, if the bank doesn't really have that, there's a sense in which if the bank fails, that money disappears, right? Even though, because it was kind of like just in your head. And so when that was happening on a grand scale in the early 1930s, there was a legitimate sense in which the money supply shrank by one third. Like from 1929 to 1933, because of so many bank failures and people who thought they had a bunch of money in the bank in 1929, about a third of that total was gone by 33. So what Milton Friedman said is that the Fed, the Federal Reserve, should have come in and just pumped up, pumped, you know, flooded with more money to offset that because he thought that's why you had this, you know, this, this, this was the main cause. So in Friedman's view, the reason the Great Depression was so awful was that the Fed was too timid and wasn't willing to pump in enough money. Whereas the Austrian view, it's the exact opposite. The Austrians say the reason there was the 29 crash was because earlier during the 20s, the Fed had been pumping in too much money, building up this unsustainable boom. So they both blame the Fed, but it's like for the opposite reason. The Austrians blame the Fed for easy money in the 20s, causing the stock market to rise, which then came crashing down in the famous you know black, black market crash of 29. Whereas Friedman says the Fed was too timid, wasn't willing to pump in enough money in the early 30s. Yeah, we can liken this to what the Austrians are saying is is that essentially when you you know when you pump in all this money, whether it's in the boom or the bust, um, you're you're it, it's like somebody getting drunk. Uh, they you know, they they're responding to different stimuli. They don't they don't see the world as it truly is. And what Austrians are saying is you just got to go cold turkey. 
and face up to what your behavior was like um, for the, you know the last however long, and it'll be 18 months or whatever, and then the economy will right itself and everything will be uh, back to things that are normal. Is that about right? Right. Yeah, that that's right. That it's the in the Austrian view that the problem in 1933, let's say, was not. Oh, gee, the Federal Reserve is so timid. Why don't they just flood the market with more money? That wasn't the issue. The issue was, why did we have to respond to this huge uh, false boom? It's because of what the Fed had done earlier. And then also, too, the reason that decline in the money supply, one of the things I did in my book, The Politically Incorrect Guide to the Great Depression, was to show that the Great Depression, the first few years, there was nothing historically unusual about prices falling like that. That had happened in earlier panics. It had happened in the depression of 1920 and 21. But the reason that didn't lead to a decade long slump was that the government let wages fall. But it was Herbert Hoover in the early 30s, while he was still in office, that tried to stop wages from falling because he thought that would just lead the economy into a downward spiral because now people don't have enough money. So how are they going to buy products? But that was the wrong thing to do. If prices are falling, you have to let labor get cheaper also. Otherwise, labor gets artificially expensive, and that's why unemployment shoots up. So it's, again, the kind of thing where the politicians in Washington just start tinkering and doing whack-a-mole and hitting things here and there, and it screws up the whole system. Let's go to Larry. He's in South Carolina. Larry, uh, listening to WTMA, you're on with Bob Murphy. Good evening to all of you, and I am really delighted to have an opportunity to uh, express this to an economist. Uh, this is sort of based on the idea of the consumption tax as articulated by people like Neil Bortz and Mr. Uh, and another, is it Linder? In any case, I think Congressman Linder, former. Nevertheless, uh, what they're talking about was a 17% tax on all, everything that's sold in America. And after I thought about it for a while, I thought it would be even more sensible to make it a 15% tax on all commodities sold in America, and that 5% of those taxes should remain in the city or state in which it was spent, and 5% should stay in the state, and 5% should go to the federal government, which would get them around a trillion dollars in each section. And that, of course, I realize that they're spending $4 trillion, and $2 trillion of which is borrowed. But that by establishing such a low rate of taxation, and that was the only tax, there would be no more taxes on industry. And I imagine industry flocking to America and happy to pay that low kind of a tax. And uh, What's the question for, uh, for Bob Murphy? I want to hear. I want him to, after listening to what I'm saying about this, tell me what does he think about this approach. I, 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 I know this, and I'm sure he's aware of it too. That Adam and Smith is consumption tax is like a sales tax. Is that what it is? Like a national yes. sales tax? Yes. Stand by. Uh, stand yes. by. We'll uh, we'll ask Bob about that here in a moment. Uh, Bob, you can stick with us for one more segment. I take it. Yep, sure thing. All right, more with uh, Bob Murphy here. His website, Consulting by RPM, as in Robert P. Murphy. If you're on the line right now, we're going to get you on here with Bob Murphy, who's with us from consultingbyrpm.com. That's his website. His new book is called Choice, and we've been discussing uh, all manner of uh, uh, economics here tonight, specifically the so-called Austrian school compared to the Keynesian school. And we were actually in the middle of a call from Larry in South Carolina, who was wondering what Bob thought about this idea of a consumption tax and I want to bring uh, both Bob and Larry uh, back on the line here. Larry, uh, for our listeners just tuning in, can you briefly recap, without going on a long extended explanation, what the consumption tax is you're asking about? Briefly, briefly, replacing the income tax and, and most of the other taxes, ex except for the uh, uh, Social Security tax, potentially. But the rest of them will be completely replaced by a consumption tax, which is a sales tax, that you pay at the time you make a purchase. And I think that just for every, re not just retail, for every sale, industrial as well, that they pay a 15% tax. And that 5% of that tax should stay in the city and county in which it was spent. 
and 5% would stay into the state, and 5% would go to the federal government. Thank you, Larry. And I'm going to I'm going to let Bob uh, answer the uh, the question at this point. Go ahead, Bob. Okay, sure. So thanks, Larry, for the question. Uh, let me just give a few quick responses. So first of all, uh, you know, I'm a voluntarist, and so we say I don't think any taxes should ever be charged. That I don't think that they're ethical, and I don't think they're necessary. I don't think that there are certain things that couldn't be provided by voluntary people paying, you know, contractually agreed upon prices for things. Now you say, okay, but they, come on, let's let's be the real world here. Let's be practical. If I had to choose, and I had the power to choose between a system based on low tax rates on consumption versus what we have now, high marginal tax rates on income with all sorts of exemptions and deductions given out to various people so the government can kind of control their behavior and steer them into the stuff they want to, of course I would pick the former. That there's the Economic theory does give some reasons that taxing consumption harms things less than taxing income. Right? In other words, taxing income is really stupid. It's It's counterproductive, especially if you get to high levels of taxation. But if you say so, you know, how come I'm not jumping around? And I, when I was younger, I did write a, a tax reform proposal for the state of California showing how they could, with the same amount of revenue, have a much more sensible system that, you know, would make the economy grow, create jobs, blah, blah, blah. But the thing is, the current system is not there because the people in Washington are stupid. They like the system the way it is, okay? And so I think it, it's a bit naive for us to get all worked up and to get put our energy into a particular tax reform proposal because they know, I mean, the current system is so messed up, of course it's not conducive to growth and, they, and it's not even raising as much revenue as they could want. But that's the thing is they want things besides just, I mean, they can print money, right? So they, they're not, they don't have a shortage of dollars. Having high tax rates helps them sort of control who's on top in certain industries. And so unfortunately, I think it's kind of where you're you're going to just put a lot of emotional energy into something and get real worked up about a particular plan that uh, I don't think is going to survive. The last thing I'll say is my concern about bringing a new qualitative type of tax, like like a national consumption tax or a carbon tax, things like that, is that they may phase out the other ones up front as part of some deal. But then down the road, when they need more revenue, they'd bring the other stuff back in. Mm -hmm. So that's why I really would not want them to introduce a qualitative new tax on something that they haven't taxed before. I've yeah. always said the it was... The income tax was like 1.5% or something like that to the very richest people... In the beginning. When, ...when it was introduced. Yeah, and I've always said it's like rearranging the deck chairs on the Titanic. I mean, these people are spending the, the you know, the uh, sales tax advocates... What do they call it? The, flat, the national sales tax or whatever. The, uh, or fair tax. That's what Neil Bortz was promoting uh, years ago. That, you know, they're spending all this effort and this time on, on this. And who knows how many millions of dollars to promote this idea. And for what? I mean, to you know, reorganize the failing federal government? Seems pointless. Right. So, I, again, uh, Larry still listening. I, that, that plan, yeah, if I could choose between having the Bortz's plan versus the current system, yes, his plan would be way better. But I'm just saying, if they even if they did that, they would just, over time, new They'd congresses would come in and start tweaking it and doing this. Because they benefit from that. They want to be able to give exemptions to their buddies or to steer people. I mean, that one of the ways Wall Street maintains its hold on investments right now is everyone participates in these, you know, 401ks and 403bs and blah blah blah. And why do they do that? Is because the main tax rate is so punitive. If they say, oh, but if you do it in these special retirement plans we've designed for you, you get to tax defer it, right? So that it's a huge club by which they get everyone to do what they want. Yep. Let's go to Libertarian Banker Aha. on the line, calling from who knows where. Uh, you're on Free Talk Live, Libertarian Banker with Bob Murphy. Hey guys, uh, really appreciate that conversation tonight. Um, I wanted to uh, ask uh, about uh, Bitcoins, and how, how do you see uh, cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin and other, uh, you know, fixed currencies that can't be printed by a government, how do you see those long-term, uh, you know, taking hold and, and actually overtaking, of, you know, the traditional forms of fiat currency? Um, because in my, in my eyes, the uh, the Federal Reserve, the immorality of the Federal Reserve comes from the government and the fact that the government backs it and the government can borrow money on behalf of unborn children. Um, so wondering, uh, w wondering about that, about Bitcoins and your thoughts long term. 
Okay, sure. So uh, let me also plug, I have a, there's a website, understandingbitcoin.us, where I did a co-authored piece with Silas Barta, a guide that I do the economics and he does the technical stuff to, to introducing Bitcoin to a, the newcomer. So if people want to go there, it's, it's a free uh, pamphlet. Uh, so I think, and let me second, I think what Ian was saying earlier, there is a sense in which cryptocurrencies are even harder than gold and silver because strictly speaking, you know, an asteroid could crash into Earth tomorrow with tons of new gold or silver where, uh, you know, chemists could come up with some new process that easily and cheaply transforms baser metals into metal and into gold and silver, mm. in which case they would no longer be scarce and that, you know, they would, wouldn't serve well as money. Whereas, as we all know, uh, you know, Bitcoin has a, a built in mathematical upper limit that can't be beaten in such a way. So there's a sense in which cryptocurrencies really are the the excellence that the best that could possibly be in terms of a finite supply uh i think that over time as more people become more comfortable with i think that's the stumbling block right now i mean i know what bitcoin is and i have some of it but i don't use it in day-to-day -day purchases it's just it hasn't impacted my personal life like that and you don't uh, live but, in new hampshire <laughs> but, well exactly I just, and i realized that so it's it's sort of a tipping point you know if everyone was doing it then everybody would do it kind it of still thing. hurts me that you don't live in new hampshire <laughs> Here you can actually but, go into a corner store. Uh, mm -hmm. There's a place called Corner News. You can walk in there and buy anything in the store with Bitcoin. So it's it's actually real. There's a vegetarian food truck in town, mm -hmm. which is really oh, cool. Oh, right. And, and that's that's what I'm saying, that yeah. I think people who are like, oh, you can never use that. because I mean, I'm I'm saying it will take time to do that, and I can see it with my own eyes that it's happening. But that that right now is the stumbling block, I think, for the average person yeah. is just – it's more of a thing like they would do, you know, because they want to help get that society there that out of, instead of practical convenience. But even like I told you earlier, I've been lately, I'm very concerned about the future. I've, I've been buying, you know, silver coins and I'm going to buy some more gold. And thing. But there are the dangers too. Well, gee, what do I do with it? You know, do I keep it in my apartment? Well, what if somebody breaks in? What do I, I don't want to get, put it in a safe deposit box. They're going to lock that thing down mm -hmm. if there's a crisis, right? So there is, there are pros and cons of various assets and cryptocurrencies they're very strong in a few key elements, namely, you know, transferability and ease of hiding it and so forth and the, and the, uh, the hard aspect in terms of the limit on the units. So I think over time, more and more people are going to embrace those, whether it's Bitcoin or some derivative. I think clearly uh, those things are going to be around. And we're in the starting future. to see uh, some real killer apps for Bitcoin now. I mean, it's taken a few years, but uh, we've been promoting SaveItPurse.com, which actually gives people 20% off or more on their Amazon purchases. So, up until kind of uh, recently, Bitcoin's adoption has been mostly among technically savvy libertarian types. You know, like libertarians like it because they can see that it can help undermine the state money system, and that's valuable to us. But the average person, Person, they don't really care about that, uh, but they do care about getting 20% off of Amazon purchases or 20% off of uh, their Starbucks coffee, which you can get at coffee.foldapp.com, which is super easy to use. I tried it out. You know, if you can give somebody an incentive, a, a, a fiscal incentive to make the switch or to start buying some of this uh, cryptocurrency like Bitcoin, then I think uh, that's really going to be a key element to pushing a wider adoption. And uh, listeners can go to saveatpurse.com to get signed up there. And when you do that, Free Talk Live gets a very small portion of any uh, future pur purchases you make. Last purchase I made at Amazon, I saved 40% because I paid with Bitcoin through saveitpurse.com. So we're really seeing some really cool development there. Bob, I, I want to thank you for spending so much time with us here tonight. I really appreciate, uh, I know you're a busy guy, so thank you for that. Well, thanks for having me, guys. And yeah, just to follow up that collar, I think he's right that as the fiat money system really hits a wall over the next few decades, I think a lot of people are going to go and, and, and try out these cryptocurrencies. So what we've seen with uh, with Greece and other places. Uh, hey, thanks, Bob, for uh, for being on with us. That's consultingbyrpm.com is his website. His new book is Choice. And we'll come back with more Free Talk Live. You can join us. <laughs> 